Leaving behind a legacy is important for a franchise, but nostalgia is often confused with a legacy in my opinion. Nostalgia is a positive look back at something you once enjoyed, whereas a legacy can be both good and painfully bad. I have no nostalgia for Dead Space. They've all been slightly bland third-person horror shooters, and there are damn good reasons why horror has air quotes surrounding it, with a nice but not that remarkable mechanic focused on severing limbs rather than going for the standard body and headshots. But Dead Space did create a legacy for itself in the form of Dead Space 3 serving as the canary in the coal mine for the gaming industry's turn toward microtransactions. You can make your own guns in Dead Space 3. Except all the best guns have steep resource costs you're either going to have to pay for out of your own pocket, or grind like hell if you want them. And now the central mechanic of severing limbs seems to have taken a back seat so the guy who ponied up $10 for the machine gun that shoots time-slowing bullets doesn't feel put off when his gun fails to kill anything because he aimed for the chest. This first sin has run on a bit long, so let me wrap it up by stating that canaries have to die to warn everyone else. I couldn't think of a more suitable sacrifice than a game that has the word dead already in the title. Mankind found himself going extinct from lack of resources. Desperate, he sought to replicate the black marker in an attempt to harness its limitless energies for himself. A civilization of galactic strip miners would have a near unlimited amount of resources and energy. It can't be so hard to solve the energy crisis that building markers that they know cause madness, death, and then undeath is the preferable option when you can travel to distant worlds, tear out continent-sized chunks, and haul them back to Earth. Let me just remove this helmet in the middle of a blizzard. Helps you hear the Insu radio that much better. This prologue takes place 200 years before the events of this game, yet it seems technology never advanced past this point. People still use the same mechanical suits, the same weapons, and the same health monitor on their back that they can't actually check since their eyes are in the front of their head. I only know this takes place 200 years ago because of some text that appeared on screen, not because of any visual context clues. Your first thought upon encountering the game's first necromorph should be similar to mine. Huh? That seems out of place. I thought these games were all about twisted abominations that vaguely resemble the humans they once were, not dude with axes and glowing eyes. The prologue was trying its best to create a sense of urgency with the soldier trying to get the codex somewhere to stop the necromorph outbreak. Then the general kills the soldier and deletes the codex. And then nothing happens here for 200 years, so I don't know why they were in such a rush. The age of man is at an end. I think that by the 26th century, we will have realized that there are better ways to reach people than giant flying billboards. I'm not even sure how you can hear the audio from that screen on the moon due to the lack of atmosphere. Isaac, I know you're there. Come on, pick up the phone. Rip photograph, unanswered messages playing in the background, squalid living conditions. This is the sign of a quickly thrown together plot starting with the previous couple having broken up in between games just so they can get back together in this one. I wasn't even aware there was a growing relationship between Isaac and Ellie, so I guess the relationship started in between games and ended there as well. Isaac looks up at the door as it randomly opens. When he goes to check it, he is tackled to the ground by Carver who is already inside of his apartment. If Carver somehow managed to cross the threshold in the blink of the eye he had before being seen, he could have just pointed his gun at Isaac before Isaac was armed, instead of hiding to ambush him when Isaac stepped forward to investigate, picking up a weapon as he did so. I understand you're something of an expert on markers. You created one. I didn't make shit. Your government made me. And you destroyed two, which is why we're here. We got a job for you. Back in Dead Space 2, Isaac was kept locked up and crazy by EarthGov to build markers. After Titan Station was destroyed, and I'm guessing a giant cover-up was instituted, you would think EarthGov would have hunted Isaac down to keep him from talking. Here he was living on the moon and they only come to him in their hour of need. I'm done with that. You find somebody else for your suicide mission. We did. Before we lost contact with her, she told us to find you. Ellie didn't seem that thrilled about risking her life chasing after markers at the end of Dead Space 2. I guess the question to ask here is how exactly is there an atmosphere on the moon to breathe and create large fireballs like that? The moon doesn't appear to be terraformed in any way, nor is there a dome over this city. She's out there all alone, Isaac, and I can't help her unless you help me. I can't really see a justifiable reason why Norton goes to the trouble of recruiting Isaac. He knows exactly where Ellie's last location was, and later he spends every scene he's in resenting the fact that Isaac is even there. This game was created as a co-op experience, so when played in single player mode like I did, you'll have an even worse time. Enemy grapple attacks take forever because the game expected you to bring a friend and knock them off of you. Certain side quests are co-op only, and there are loading gates everywhere that are meant to assure the two of you stay in the same room. Who the hell are you guys? EarthGov's last battalion. Name's Norton. Captain Robert Norton. Sergeant John Carver. Isaac Clarke's name is cobbled together from genre-defining science fiction authors. John Carver is named after the guy who came to America on the Mayflower. You can clearly see the juxtaposition between the two. Last battalion? What do you mean? 
Last means last, genius, as in no more left. Somehow Isaac was completely unaware that the entire Earth government was taken over by the unitologists and every single military battalion was wiped out except Norton's. To be fair, I don't think anyone else noticed either. Seemed like it was business as usual despite the fall of civilization into the hands of a doomsday cult. Here's the second moment that makes your brain go, huh? Dead Space has never been a cover shooter where you trade shots with other humans. This change undermines the one unique mechanic the game had, fighting monsters by shooting off their limbs. Surviving a suicide bomber at that range would take a miracle. These are unitologists! Why are they trying to kill us? Isaac acts like unitologists trying to kill him is some new experience. Why are these fanatics after You've me? You've destroyed markers in the past, Isaac. That makes you a direct threat to their plan. Plan. Some end time prophecy based on the markers. Convergence? Isaac has apparently forgotten every experience he's had with unitologists. If this scene feels familiar, it's because every Dead Space game has a moment where Isaac walks through a door and is captured by unitologists. This one's still alive. Bring him here. Just keep shooting him and you win. Why stop? Isaac Clark. Just the man I was looking for. Oh, don't waste your energy. You're going to be dead in a matter of minutes. Then make it a matter of seconds and put one between Isaac's eyes. See that? That's a marker test lab. They're everywhere at all the major colonies and outposts. How did Isaac ever miss that? In fact, shouldn't this marker have been calling out to him like the one back on Titan Station did? They're everywhere at all the major colonies and outposts. So after the events on Titan Station where billions died and the station was lost due to a marker, Earth got built even more of them and placed them on every planet in humans' control. There are so many marker-related cock-ups in not just the games, but Dead Space comics and animated films, that I find it hard to believe that at some point a review wasn't conducted to determine the efficacy of this energy plan. Notice how Danik is already dressed for extreme cold even though the moon colony is temperate. Like the devs didn't even bother making a different model for him. Why would a cult that is so powerful that it can take over the government right under everyone's nose leave Isaac alive all this time if making sure he didn't stop them was important? Why wait until the day of your promised convergence to deal with the last remaining loose thread that could ruin everything? That easy, huh? It's not like they couldn't lean over the edge and shoot Isaac while he was out cold for a moment after the fall. Shouldn't that pile of corpses Isaac landed on be necromorphing now that the marker is active? These guys on the other side of the room do. Who's that? A boy. Cute kid. He leaned behind. He's dead. Danik killed him. Carver also carries with him a photograph that proves he has more of a character beyond just shooting things. He had a family, and I assume a dog. Congratulations, you've given him the same amount of death as one of those stick figure family stickers on the back of someone's SUV. It's an SOS coming from that ship dead ahead. The CMS Roanoke. I would have a bit more foresight than to name a colony ship after a colony that famously vanished. Those lights, are they beacons? Hang on. No. My! Normally, you want mines to be hard to spot, which precludes putting bright red lights on them. Here! Grab some of that paneling and seal up that doorway! I don't think some caulking is going to make an elevator into a vacuum-sealed escape pod. That EVA suit fits perfectly over regular clothes and that giant metal health sensor on Isaac's back does it. Since one of Dead Space helmets not been part of the suit, Isaac almost dies because his helmet needs to be put on this time. For the rest of the game, that same helmet will retract back into the suit like they always do. I can't slow it down! Well, yeah. No wonder you can't slow it down. In space, you need to accelerate against momentum to slow down. Carver is still behind the sealed room, pushing against it with his rocket boots. Watch it! Watch it! I can't see around it! That part's through it! Every human inside that container would be dead. I hope you like elevators in your gaming experience, because Dead Space 3 barely has a single room that doesn't have Isaac getting inside an elevator or a cycling bulkhead door. Ellie has been trapped on this derelict ship for some time. This is the same Ellie that was depicted as a tough survivor in Dead Space 2, capable of taking care of herself while dragging a lunatic around behind her. Yet she was completely helpless in this far less dangerous situation. Oh, Ellie, baby. Norton never bothered mentioning to Isaac that he and Ellie were in a relationship on the right here, but will now proceed to remind Isaac of that fact every single scene he's in. It appears Ellie received more than a new eye between games, judging by her cleavage. Isaac, thank you for coming. Like I had a choice. Isaac and Ellie broke up due to Isaac not wanting to deal with markers again. Norton is the commander of an EarthGov battalion. EarthGov was the institution that used Isaac to create markers and place them on every human world and colony. Why would she break up with Isaac over his reluctance to fight markers and go out with someone who would have been under orders to protect them? The trail ends at the Admiral's quarters. She'd written marker school all over the walls. The answers are in there. I know it. How would you know the answer to everything is in the marker scroll the Admiral left on her walls? You can't decipher it yourself, so this is just a best guess. And the marker destroys a person's mind and bends them to its will. Anything written by someone who was influenced by a marker can't be trusted. And if this scroll were so important, why didn't you take photos so Isaac didn't have to drag himself across the station to look at it? The Admiral was obsessed with making a key. A key to what? what? Hey, a 
key to what? Some sort of alien device. A machine. I think that she believed that it controlled the markers. It should not have taken Isaac to decipher the Admiral's marker scrawlings. It's actually pretty clear what it depicts, with detailed drawings of everything important. This isn't just some random planet, Isaac. They found the source. The marker homeworld. That's a big extrapolation. When the black marker was exhumed on the Earth in 2214, it defied our understanding of science. It appeared to generate limitless energy, a trait of obvious importance in our resource-strapped times. According to this presentation film, humans first encountered markers in the 23rd century. They were having resource and energy problems as far back as then. This game depicts over three centuries of humans supposedly being in an ongoing energy crisis. It couldn't have been that dire if they'd been continuing to operate normally on this timescale. This ship is crawling with necromorphs, yet Ellie can work by herself in this area with no weapons. Remember, Isaac had to be dragged here to rescue her, yet she doesn't seem like she was in that much danger after Isaac opened a few doors and found her. If she's right and this is the marker homeworld, maybe there's a chance of stopping this. <laughs> we both know how this is going to end. If they found a way to stop the markers 200 years ago, don't you think we'd all be shaped by now? It doesn't add up. Norton makes an astute point, but because he is now depicted as the heel stealing Isaac's ex-girlfriend, no one will ever take his point into consideration. Norton started this game by recruiting Isaac since Isaac destroyed two other markers, which made it seem like Norton was on board with Ellie's mission. But he really just wanted to save Ellie. He didn't need to recruit Isaac for that. He knew where Ellie was, after all. There's no stronger sign that zero new ideas made it into this game than when the Regenerator shows up for the third time. Reusing the same scenario in every game because a few people found it scary the first time is such a baffling move I would argue it's devs cutting costs more than anything else. Strengthening my cost-cutting argument even further, the game plays the same exact recording Isaac found in Dead Space 2 about using necromorph limbs as projectiles. Every mission Isaac receives is just a checklist of things he must do to re-establish the status quo. They need a ship to get down to the planet, so Isaac will have to travel to another end of the station to find a part to fix it. Then Isaac has to find all the parts to make a remote navigation system, refuel the ship, and then finally salvage navigation data from satellites. Am I playing a game or applying for building permits from the government? Ellie, you have to admit it sounds crazy. I mean, how do we know there's really a solution down there? Because you told me, in the Admiral's quarters, you said, turn it off. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Ellie fails to realize that marker-induced insanity steers a person in the direction of helping the markers, not stopping them. Isaac should also realize this, seeing that he's been through the exact situation twice. With all that planning and technical work to get the ship in working order, no one spared a moment to mention the mines that destroyed their old ship or discuss where they were going to land. This is the flight path Isaac created from the satellite data, taking them right through a debris field and for some reason a mountain canyon. I'm not aware of a single person in history surviving something going catastrophically wrong during re-entry. So when their ship breaks apart in flight, I would expect all of them to die. There are just some things you can't get away with in an action scene. Isaac wasn't strapped into his seat during the descent. Yet after the crash, he's hanging upside down due to his restraints. If Isaac is freezing to death in his EVA suit on this planet, Ellie should have been dead in minutes with her plunging neckline. Necromorphs are not known for self-preservation. They will drag themselves toward Isaac after he shot their head and legs off, so it's a bit odd that this big necromorph runs away whenever Isaac deals enough damage to it. It's a weak excuse so the devs can get three repeated boss fights out of it. I can't exactly fault Norton for getting pissy when Ellie does this whenever Isaac shows up. Outside of that one kiss, there is no development of their relationship, and the game will give itself an easy way out with Norton's death shortly after this. I've been digging through what's left of the research notes and I thought all that stuff was destroyed. Well, computer data, yes. But the written logs discuss a signal tracking experiment that pinpointed the machine's exact location. A cover-up would certainly destroy digital and written logs. All of them survive this explosion. Here's an interesting fact I noticed in this game. Not a single person who bites it dies to a necromorph or a unitologist, making both of the game's threats pretty ineffective. Ellie! I'm trapped! The drill's trying to kill me! Isn't there an off switch? No! Uh, wait! Yeah, there's a, there's a yellow fuse in the center. I'll try to shoot it. Sticking a fragile fuse at the center of your drill bit seems like a massive design flaw for something intended to drill into solid rock. Here's another mission that plays out like an IKEA instruction manual. To follow the signal to the machine, they need the necromorph thawed out. To thaw out the necromorph, they need the power on. Then they need to get the steam engine running. Then Isaac needs to build a probe gun before heading inside of it to shoot lesions. This research station was built 200 years ago in the 24th century, yet was using an old film projector to display mission presentations. This film projector has been running for over 200 years without needing the film changed, rewound, or degrading. These hide-and-seek enemies were a nice addition in Dead Space 2, even if they are just a rip-off of the Spec Ops enemies in Half-Life. But reusing them again in Dead Space 3 is just showing me a trick I already know. In fact, I can't recall a single new enemy type in this game. Norton, open the cage. No.
Isaac has Kinesis in his suit and can just flip the switch on the console right next to him. And why would Norton bother raising the cage out of the Necromorph if he was just going to leave Isaac locked in the cage once out? Leaving Isaac down there would have prevented him from using Kinesis on the switch. Considering how easy it is to take Isaac by surprise just by waiting around a corner, the Unitologist should just continue to set up traps like this. But thanks to your friend, Norton, I finally found it. That's how they followed us through shock space. Well, well he is a bright one. All he wants is Isaac. Carver, the rest of us can go home. If this was all a setup, then it makes very little sense. Norton tried to give Danik Isaac, but the Unitologist already knew where Isaac was on the moon, and they captured him and tried to kill him back then, and they were not aware of this planet and its importance. So they couldn't have planned to follow Isaac to this planet after he escaped because until Norton showed up, Isaac wasn't going anywhere. Norton would have had to send that message before his ship was destroyed by mines, which means Norton recruited Isaac to help rescue Ellie, then sent a message to Danik offering him Isaac if he helped him, which he didn't even know he would need at the time seeing as he had a ship of his own. No, 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 no! No, you promised me a ship, Danik! We had a deal! Yes, I'm sorry about that. But I can't afford to leave even one of you left alive. Apologies for misleading you, Captain. After the last time, why would you bother talking with him and then start the execution with Norton instead of Isaac? <laughs> Carver had plenty of time to shoot Danik, but didn't and let him escape. This boss fight represents what EA did to Visceral Games. Ate them, then crapped them out. You made us come down here. You encouraged her. You involved him. Brought him here even. Ellie was the one who insisted on going to the planet to stop the markers. I don't even care about these stupid contradictions since this romantic triangle is pointless. So I shot Norton, stomped his head off, and then presented it to Ellie. You can thank me for this new story canon. Ellie, come on. Norton was pointing a gun at my face. I'm sorry. Is that supposed to make it okay? Maybe not okay, but definitely justified. You never believed in me, or this mission, or us. I had to go find someone else to help me, and now he's dead. All of the issues Ellie had with Isaac not wanting anything to do with markers anymore were also found in Norton. Norton stated over and over again that they should leave instead of staying on the planet. I can't even tell you this lady's name without looking it up, but she's just an expository information dump on the research they did here and how to repeat it, so I hardly care for her fate. I don't see why that lady had to die from the fall if Isaac gets to survive the same fall seconds later. This is the third time fighting this thing and you would think finally killing it would give you some catharsis, but it's just a great big meh. Can we have this character moment a few feet to the right? Isaac's heels are still dangling over the abyss. How the hell do we find this Rosetta? She must have a lab up there someplace. I'm getting very annoyed that these people continue to think Rosetta was a person. That part of history can't be lost to them. It certainly wasn't lost to the researchers who named it. According to this, we're here to assemble Rosetta. They cut her into pieces? Oh my god. Since Rosetta was frozen and cut into pieces, wouldn't you only need to assemble the head parts to scan its memories? You may be surprised to know that I'm a man of science. A man of fact and reason. I cannot think of a single reason why Danik is so fixated on starting a dialogue with Isaac. Why spend so much time trying to destroy Isaac with facts and logic if you're just going to kill him all the same? Fact. The marker exerts a field of influence that guides and grows biological organisms, evolving them over time towards some greater purpose. You see where this is going? Yes, the marker is just an evil version of the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Everyone pieced that mystery together back in the first game. What purpose does all this conversation hope to serve? Well, the next time we see each other, and I shoot you in the face, <laughs> you will understand why. You could have shot him in the face on two separate occasions. There's no reason to believe Danik won't mess up the third, which he does. Meet Rosetta. Where's her face? She doesn't have a face. It's not even a she. It's an it. Rosetta's an alien. What? Why would you be surprised by the existence of aliens? It's been clear from the beginning that markers were not originally built by humans. Rosetta isn't a marker, so why does activating the brain scan of Rosetta trigger a mind dive in Isaac? It should simply be downloading the information into the codex. Dead Space is starting to feel like the alien franchise after Ridley Scott came back and added lore. If the machine shuts down, everything thaws, and convergence has resumed not just here, but Everywhere the markers have spread. <clears throat> I 
And this is... Danik and his men stormed the lab while Isaac was riding the mine wave, then ordered Ellie and Carver to keep quiet until he finished, figuring Isaac would fail to notice the situation, then openly spell out the truth about the alien machine in the codex. Well, come on, kill them! That makes the third time Danik has failed to kill Isaac while having a gun pointed at him. I love you! No body, no emotion. No one is going to fall for a fake death this obvious. Shape and moon in orbit. That's what controls the markers. It's the end state of these creatures. Or rather, it would have been. You see, the natives of this planet constructed a machine that froze the moon in mid-formation. But it wasn't enough. The moon of this planet was created from the biological material the aliens pulled into the sky by the marker. Even if you swept up every living speck of biomatter on a planet, it would have enough mass to create something the size of a moon. But there is hope. The natives never finished configuring the machine. It wasn't meant to merely freeze the moon, it was meant to destroy it. The native aliens created a machine to freeze the moon while it was forming, yet failed to configure it to destroy the moon as well. That configuration ends up being incredibly simple. Simply turning the codex in the machine does it. How do you screw up something that simple when your entire civilization rests on it? The alien city comes straight out of Lovecraft. Too bad they only succeeded in capturing the visual aesthetic of Lovecraft and none of the psychological horror of the unknown. This has to be the worst way possible to detonate a bomb. Stick a cartridge inside the bomb casing which activates an automatic countdown of just a few seconds for the poor guy who had to install the cartridge. Isaac, is that you? You are unbelievably hard to kill, are you aware of that? He isn't really. You were just unbelievably bad at killing him. I have no idea what even happened in this scene. Isaac detonates a charge in his own face and then falls down in front of Danik and they wrestle over the codex. The explosion alone should have taken Isaac's head off. You would think an alien city would free up the devs imagination when it comes to puzzle design. You'd be wrong. The last act of the game is taken up by another IKEA instructions quest. Isaac! You're alive! But how did you- I, I escaped the delivery tubes, but they called me. Ellie survived being trapped inside the room filled with spontaneous combustion gas. She says she climbed through the delivery tubes to escape, not like the gas couldn't flow through one of those. And what stopped her from radioing Isaac while she was crawling through the tube to tell him that she was okay? There's nothing to study, he said. It's all dead space. It only took three games, but ladies and gentlemen, we have a title. Give me the codex, or I will kill her. No! Isaac, what are you doing? You, you got a second chance. If he turns off the machine, we're all dead. This is one of the very rare times when the protagonist uses reason when it comes to the hostage standoff. Of course, it still goes badly because Carver's character moment has arrived, and he no longer believes sacrificing someone for the good of all is a great idea. Except in this case where he's dead wrong. His time of emotional growth couldn't have come at a worse moment. Why would you design this machine to have the option to turn off when you know that doing so would damn all life in the galaxy? At the very least, make them separate switches. When I finish this, it's all going down. Everything. You have to go. You can redeclare your love after you activate the machine. The codex is right there. Ellie even runs right past it on the way to the shuttle to leave Isaac and Carver to die. Isaac waited until the place is torn apart and has to island hop across the floating rubble to reach it. For our finale, we receive a boss fight where you stand in one spot without needing to move while flinging markers at a giant eyeball. It's questionable whether this machine would still work after being torn up and tossed into the sky. Isaac and Carver survived this. And no, I'm not playing the DLC to prove it. And it wouldn't matter if I did. Because even Isaac and Carver are incredulous that they're alive. Ellie. Ellie. Sequel baiting. This is why it's a very bad idea. 